Up next, we have uh, from the Newfoundland and Labrador Medical Association, the president, Dr. Lynn Dwyer. Thank you for coming today and take it away. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak this morning on this very important topic. The LMA is a professional association that represents all 1,280 practicing physicians in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Our mission is to represent and support a united medical profession and provide leadership in the provision of excellent health care in Newfoundland and Labrador. We, we represent our physicians in workplace and medical practice issues, and we provide a variety of services and benefits to our members. We also negotiate compensation and working conditions with the provincial government. The physicians of this province are a diverse group. There is a 50-50 split between specialists and family doctors, and about a 60-40 split between those who are compensated through the fee-for-service system and those employed by salaries. Even with our own memorial trained graduates, we rely heavily on international medical graduates who make up 40% of practicing physicians in the province. Doctors are expected to provide excellent and ongoing care for their patients. Our work is directly impacted by available public sector resources, such as hospitals and medical equipment, community services, and pharmaceuticals. Physician care is also affected by a health policy framework of the government. The LMA regularly advocate, engages in advocacy to, in order to push public policy in a patient-friendly direction. I'm going to start this morning with a little bit of uh, humor. Uh, the NLMA has been closely following the <laughs> the NLMA has been fo uh, closely following the fiscal dilemma of the provincial government, and we see many risks for our patients and health professionals. Indeed, the fiscal situation is the most important strategic issue that we face. It is the one issue that can severely disrupt so many of the things that physicians and other providers rely upon to provide high quality patient care. I will outline for you today our perspective on the province's fiscal health and the advice we have provided to government on how it could be managed. The program for today's forum asks the question, what can we afford in health care? I would like to argue that this question is not actually a health policy question, what can we afford? It is a relevant question, it is an important question, but it is essentially a fiscal policy question. The government in managing the province's finances establishes an envelope within which health policies must be delivered. The question of what we can afford, therefore, relies upon factors outside the health sector, in which health sector stakeholders are just one set of players. The LMA's approach has been to obtain a clear understanding of the fiscal picture and stake out a framework in which a high quality health care system can be sustained within the available budget. To elaborate on our perspective, I would like to first discuss what we know and what we don't know about the government's fiscal plans and the health envelope. I will then explain the case we have made for a review of health facilities and services in the province as a measure to live within whatever the fiscal envelope may be. Our whole approach has been about transforming the health care system in a planned and rational way so that the uncertainties and risks associated with government's fiscal situation do not create unreasonable burdens for the patients of the province. At the broadest level, the government has outlined a plan to eliminate budget deficits and return to surplus by 2022-23. The Auditor General has described this approach as mainly relying on increased revenues, primarily from oil, and decreased expenditures of $376 million. If the health sector was asked to bear its fair share of this expenditure reduction, it would mean $150 million in cost cutting, but no such declaration has been made by government. We do not have any detailed information on where these program spending reductions will be made. The Auditor General has also highlighted the risks that could, be, that could prevent the government from achieving its deficit targets, including 
lower than expected oil prices and production, difficulties achieving spending cuts, slower economic growth than predicted, and the impact of muskrat falls rate mitigation should taxpayers be asked to bear some of this burden. The credit rating agencies thus far may have maintained the province's credit rating, but are watching closely to ensure the government shows discipline. For the rating agencies and the financial markets, discipline means raising taxes or deeper expenditure cuts should some of the risks start to materialize. From a health care perspective, these risks could create a larger than expected deficit that would force the government into more aggressive cost cutting. The LMA views this possibility as a direct risk for our patients because it could mean sudden decreases in health spending. It is this broad category of risk, the possibility that government will have to take quick and significant steps to maintain its deficit targets, that creates the need for a health sector plan. If sudden and significant health sector cuts are necessary, we believe they should be guided by a carefully developed plan that would protect quality and access to the greatest extent possible. The question is, where is this plan? Turning next to what we know about the health budget, we do not know anything beyond the current budget year. While there is a forecast for the government as a whole, we do not have a multi-year forecast for the health sector. In the absence of a forecast, the best we can assume from the fiscal messaging of the government is that there is no new money, that the budget for health will remain the same for the whole period to 2022-23. We see evidence of this general approach as new spending proposals are frowned upon unless they are linked to federal funding, while cost-saving initiatives are welcomed. So are we to assume that the health budget will remain constant for the next several years while the deficit of government is being reduced to zero? If so, the health budget would continue to be about $3 billion per year. In reality, a constant dollar budget does not mean that cost cutting is not required. In fact, cost cutting will be required every year for several reasons. The first reason is inflation. New pharmaceuticals must be approved each year. Routine price increases for hospital supplies, goods and services, professional services, and other types of procurement must be paid. Replacement of machinery and equipment particularly technology that has become outdated, also requires new dollars. Routine maintenance can only be deferred for so long before new spending is necessary. Each and every year, the health budget must accommodate these pressures, whether at the government level or within the regional health authorities. New priorities also emerge, which contribute to ongoing pressure within the health care budget. This is not a bad thing. Change is good, and new priorities must take the place of older, lesser priorities. Over time, new priorities arise, for example, mental health and addictions, primary health care renewal, or chronic disease management. In a constant dollar budget, new priorities must take the place of old spending. Therefore, cost cutting must occur. So is there a plan? Is there a plan that specifies the areas which should be cut to cope with inflation and new priorities? Is there a plan for what new priorities need to be addressed in the health sector? We do know that the government and the RHAs have initiated many projects to achieve greater efficiency in the health care system. For example, IT consolidation under the leadership of the Center for Health Information, consolidation of procurement under the leadership of Central Health, as well as appropriateness of care projects that you address the utilization of tests and procedures and hospital efficiency. The Food Services Plan of Eastern Health announced last week is another example of efficiency planning. The Choosing Wisely initiative, which is located within Memorial University and which has many partners, including the NLMA, is mainly focused on quality of care but may have quality impact, 
positive impacts on costs. The LMA has been consulted and engaged on some of these projects, but we have no way of determining whether they can produce the savings necessary to live within a constant dollar budget. We are unaware of a guiding plan that states which services will be trimmed and which new priorities will be funded. The way forward, though a helpful document, does not give enough detail on these questions. Specific plans for new services in mental health and addictions and chronic disease management have been published. We applaud these priorities, but the, qu the question remains, what is the financial plan to adequately fund the new priorities and how is the province paying for these new priorities? It is, at the is it at the expense of other programs? We fear that a plan does not exist. We are concerned that when the finance department gives the health department its annual budget, there will be a scramble to trim programs and services to fit within the new ceiling. Under this approach, without a guiding plan containing a vision and a logical set of steps to replace new priorities with old ones, the cost reduction proposals are made behind closed doors with hurried analysis, hardly any public debate, and sometimes negative consequences. Moreover, once announced, some of these reductions are reversed because of unanticipated implementation problems. These are circumstances where our patients are put at risk. Short-term, budget-driven cost reduction can produce deficient plans and sometimes ineffective results. Thus far, I have outlined two main reasons for our health sector plan the risks associated with the provincial deficit, and the risks posed by living within a constant dollar health budget. I would like to discuss two other reasons, the changing demographic face of the province and the disruption occurring to health care through digital technologies. The demographic character of the province has changed dramatically over the last 50 years when the basic locations of our health facilities were decided. The rural population has declined, especially in the 1990s, and the urban areas, especially on the Avalon Peninsula, have increased. Simultaneously, the age structure of the province has shifted with an emerging senior population that will double in size over the next 20 years. Our population over 65 years of age will be, by a considerable margin, the largest senior population in Canada. These two tidal waves are actually reinforcing each other because much of our aging population is occurring in our shrinking rural communities. The shifting and shrinking of population is reducing the volumes for some types of health services, such as pediatrics, and leading to an explosion of demand for other types of services, especially related to chronic diseases that become more complex as we age. Can our healthcare system respond to these emerging needs while working for many years to stay within a constant dollar budget? The demand for services related to aging, chronic disease, and independent living is an additional layer on top of the inflationary costs of healthcare. And there is no comprehensive multi-year plan that identifies this growth in demand as compared to available funds. In the area of technology, all of us are aware of the disruption occurring in many industries owing to the astounding advances in digital technologies. More and more business has moved online and whole categories of jobs and work have been substantially altered or eliminated. Healthcare is similarly changing. While health services will always be focused on care and will need longitudinal relationships between patients and providers, the amount of change that will occur could be startling. Technology has the potential to transform diagnosis and treatment man management. Patient empowerment will arise from electronic health records that can be accessed and monitored from personal devices, enabling patients to become partners in their care with their health care providers. 
Personalized and precision medicine will require new types of services and investments in technology and skills. So where are we in Newfoundland and Labrador? While there is reason for optimism, we have not kept up with the, ch with the pace of change. We are just now sorting out fee codes so doctors can use telephones with patients. We still require providers and patients to use facility-based telemedicine sites to use video technology. We have finally taken a bold leap forward in the use of electronic medical records with excellent collaboration between government health authorities, and physicians. We are just at the early stages of implementation. The quality of information sharing is improving dramatically, and already we have more than 100,000 patients, about 20% of the population, are being served by doctors who use EMR in this province. But advances are still needed in online ordering of tests, online prescriptions, and online referrals. The key point here is that investment will be needed to keep face with the changing uh, face of medicine. These investments will be needed in advance of the potential efficiencies and savings that may arise, but even these are uncertain. How will a constant dollar health budget afford the investments necessary to deal with technological change? Some investment may occur from private sector partnerships, but that source clearly has limitations in our public health care system. In order to keep pace with changes in technology, the public system needs to be flexible enough to, do, to divert resources to new priorities. There are many risks and reasons why a health sector plan is needed at this time. We believe there are substantial costs associated with the provincial deficit, the need for a systemic approach when living with a constant dollar health budget, the shifts in population structure that are continuing to reshape the province, and the disruptive forces in technology. All of these add up to a need to reassess certain fundamentals, to undertake a health sector planning process that is robust and visionary and engages all stakeholders, including the public. If a planning process is started, the first question will again be, what is the budget in which the health care system must operate? This is not an unreasonable question, as it will guide the scope and scale of the recommendations of the planning process. There is no question that our provincial government spends much more than any other province on health services. The approximately $3 billion we spend is equivalent to 127% of the national average per capita amount. If Newfoundland and Labrador had health expenditures at the national average, we would be spending $605 million less than we are at present. If we were spending at the average of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, two provinces with large geography and dispersed populations, our expenditures would decline by $402 million. These comparisons are somewhat arbitrary and do not account for some of the unique characteristics of Newfoundland and Labrador. Some of our higher spending is justified by the lowest population density of all provinces, far flung peninsulas requiring three times the amount of roads per capita than the rest of the country, the large size of an older population with a large burden of chronic disease, and the poorest population health status of any province in Canada. There is no accepted budget process to factor in these items. How much we spend on health care is a policy choice. It is a choice that takes into account public expectations, the fiscal health of the government, and the competing demands of other <coughs> sectors. In an ideal world, this amount would also be what we could afford. Expectations would be carefully balanced with fiscal health and other priorities, and a stable health care budget consistent with sound fiscal management over a period of years would emerge. Then the health sector would plan its future with a sense of stability and purpose. Government's answer thus far is to maintain a constant dollar budget over the next five years until it returns to surplus. 
that budget is $3 billion. Others may argue that this amount, this definition of what we can afford, is the wrong one. The NLMA will not weigh in on this question. We are more concerned about the risk to our patients if the deficit plan is knocked off course, if short-term decisions are made to fit within the constant dollar health budget, and if big changes are necessary to cope with changing demography and technology. I would like to discuss now the planning process the NLMA proposed a year ago to address these needs. It re remains very relevant today. When the provincial government called on its citizens to put forward ways to save money as part of its multi-year renewal initiative, we looked at the components of our health spending that are the highest in relation to the national average. While the government is not defining affordability in relation to the national average, it is still useful to look at what components of our health care system give rise to the highest per capita spending. This approach led us to recommend a review of health care facilities and services in the province. The highest levels of spending in comparison to the national average occurs in hospital, long-term care facilities, and capital purchases. In fact, hospital spending alone accounts for the full gap in spending between the provincial and the national average. For a small population, the large number of small facilities and services create far higher costs per patient. Therefore, a framework plan that addresses what core services should be provided and in which locations with the implications for medical transportation, technology, and human resources provides the most realistic focus. We are not saying the healthcare system should have less resources in the future, but if we continue to have a flat $3 billion budget, we still need a plan that adjusts in a rational way for inflation, for new priorities, demographic shifts, and technology, and copes with a sudden jolt if the province's deficit risk sideswipes the healthcare system. So whether or not a financial crisis occurs, a long-term plan for the health sector is a good idea. There is no downside to rethinking the structure of health care delivery in this province. The forum convened by the LMA in October of 2016, which included stakeholders from many professions, including health authorities, non-governmental groups, educators, municipal governments, unions, and the business community, endorsed the need for a review of facilities and services in the province. Then, in January of 2017, the LMA put forward a specific approach that the government could follow. We recommended the adoption of a planning methodology used in Tasmania and other states called the Role <laughs> Delineation Framework. Today's forum is not the place to dive deep into this topic, However, I would like to explain that this methodology provides a systemic assessment of each health facility in the province and the services contained within it. A clinical service plan then emerges that takes into account the population demand for each type of service, the minimum volume of services required at each site to maintain quality and safety, and the opportunities for consolidation or use of technology. This type of service and facility level review has not been done in this province in decades. It is the type of analysis that should be done as a matter of course, but especially now given the forces and pressure swirling around us. In particular, it can identify priority areas for investment, as well as structural changes needed, where resources can be moved around with the least disruption of service delivery and quality. The short-term decision making that is sometimes associated with our system of government can be an impediment to the type of review that we are asking for. When Canada decided to adopt a universal single payer model of health care, we also created the conditions for centralization of almost all decision making authority in a single place. The key decisions that loom over our health care system are made in the nexus between regional health authorities and the Department of Health and overseen by cabinet government. Often the processes and information considered inside this black box 
are unobservable by our healthcare stakeholders and patients. Sometimes we get great decisions and enlightened vision, and sometimes we do not. Therefore, our recommendations for a review of facilities and services include a substantial emphasis on independence and engagement with ultimate accountability to the government. We suggested the minister appoint the reviewers and recommendations will go back to the minister. Otherwise, the review would operate as an independent process with the ability to engage stakeholders and help educate the public with open dialogue. The process would also include clinical advisory groups to ensure critical expertise and interdependencies are taken into account. We can understand why the government has been hesitant to adopt this recommendation. It would engender uncomfortable discussions about location of services, consolidations, and changes that would affect healthcare providers and patients. Thus far, the government has opted for project or service specific planning. Unquestionably, good work can be accomplished in this way. However, we remain concerned that fundamentally important topics will be unaddressed. The risks we have identified in our presentation will still exist, and short-term decision-making in the event of a fiscal crisis will prevail over a long-term vision. To delay our proposed review is the biggest risk of all. The province has changed dramatically. Our province is simply not this place it was decades ago when all locational decisions for buildings and services were made. How much health care can we afford? Let's do a review of facilities and services and find out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dwyer, and fantastic timekeeping on your part. Um, questions, please. Oh. I'd like to again talk about the elephant in the room, which I think is bad health governance. Um, I think, I mean, this forum came about in part because Wade Locke was concerned about having a commission. A commission is a device or an instrument to bring various communities together to create networks, to create new forms of knowledge and, and information, and, and to engage the, the, the public and have a permanent impact. Um, the challenge with a kind of a silo-based approach, having kind of various um, you know, sectors or elements within the system, talking about their issues, their problems, presenting their, their frameworks, uh, even Pat Parfrey's, uh, I, I like the idea in terms of a health accord, but the problem I have in terms of the design of that health accord is the kind of the spike uh, wheel approach, kind of the bilateral approach that, you know, the idea for health governance is to bring people together within, within an integrated way. So I guess my, my question is, how do we work around these path dependencies, these silos, these, these very complex systems which make it very difficult to engage citizens? Citizens, for the most part, are kind of pawns to be, to be moved around with different ideas and, and you know, venues and, and so on and so forth. So I think that the really critical question is, how do we bring these various interests together, these various institutions together in a way which will serve the public interest? Because I think for the most part, uh, that hasn't happened. Whereas a discussion in terms of social determinants, if anything, disparity has increased. Um, so social determinants are getting worse. We haven't done very much in terms of improving uh, and, and ensuring that the things that really matter to community health are actually promoted or, or advanced. So I guess my, my question is, what kind of dialogues? I mean, if we don't have a royal commission, if there are other means or ways in order to address or deal with these really critical issues that really, for the most part, are not being addressed in part because of the, the system, the complex systems which, which don't allow the sharing of information and the sharing of, uh, again, creating a, a, a common perspective. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the, that uh, question. So don't think I have a, a simple or a easy answer to that. Uh, I mean, certainly, as we're all aware, we have to operate within the, the fiscal climate that we're currently in. And I think, as traditionally, we have probably all operated in our own silos. So there was the hospital based care, the primary care, and you know, physicians were doing one thing and nurses. And it's probably because we haven't, over the years, had this dialogue of being able to get together and discuss that have led to where we are now. And maybe 
to answer your question best would be maybe we start today, even just having this forum here today will allow us to start to have a more open dialogue than what we have been having, because certainly we do need to have that dialogue. Okay, we had a question from the lady in the green lanyard, and then we'll take Dr. Parr, okay. please. So Lynn, just over here in the front. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, some things that I thought about and the question which was just spoken about and that is the uh, fact that uh, how do we bring people together? Mm -hmm. uh, social determinants of health is something mm -hmm. which community health and humanities would mm -hmm. very much like to focus on. And uh, we don't see any, and Ms. Hagi also spoke about it, but there are no additional resources being given. But also, if you look at the spending on hospitals, where it's 61% as opposed to 53% in the rest of the country, uh, I think it has to do with the kind of complex uh, illnesses that the patient population here has. But I also wonder if uh, there is something else that is happening, and that is that a lot of the acute care beds are being occupied by people who should really not be there. They do not have a place to go, so they mm -hmm. end up by being in those acute uh, beds, which of course we know cost a mm -hmm. tremendous amount mm -hmm. of money. So. Part of that solution, if people are going to talk about, is also to see how people really need to be moved through the institutions, mm -hmm. uh, besides looking at the complex diseases that people suffer from. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on these uh, related issues. Uh, well, you, you've certainly highlighted uh, you know, several uh, different issues. I guess uh, traditionally we haven't always looked at the social determinants of health. and. As was highlighted earlier today, certainly even addressing, you know, housing can have a significant impact on, on our patients' um, uh, health. You know, um, uh, we certainly have probably in the past had more of a hospital-based system, and part of, uh, I didn't speak a lot today about primary care reform, but certainly there is a movement uh, now within the uh, medical association in collaboration with government getting back to primary health care reform and trying to you know get some of that focus back on primary care and in the community as opposed to in a hospital based system and and uh, beds uh, maybe if we were able to conduct that review of our uh, facilities and services that would also help to streamline and make things more efficient in the in the long term Question okay. over here. So I was just just to comment first of all to Dr. T Tomlin there. I didn't provide any design for a health accord. I just provide an aspiration. So whatever way you kind of would like to bring the stakeholders together is fine by me. My question of Lynn is that some of the uh, ideas you have echo some of the ideas that I had with this health accord. You're asking for a plan. Mm -hmm. And the reality is is that we're talking about the Titanic, <laughs> right? Yes. And it's yes. reaching the iceberg, yes. and it's not going to be able to turn that fast. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you're not going to be able to close down acute care hospitals until you've got community-based centers up and running. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change behavior of practitioners for years because it, it's just and changing culture is uh, is difficult and long standing. So, if your if if your plan is to uh, uh, transform the healthcare system, it ain't going to happen in one political cycle. No. So, right. how how do you deal with this short term budgetary problem as against the fact that we need long term changes? Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that, that's a very good uh, question, that analogy that you used the, uh, with, with respect to the Titanic. I had actually used that when we were preparing for this presentation, you know, our, our uh, uh, 
our healthcare system is like the Titanic and we're trying to, to turn this boat around. So is it going to happen overnight? Definitely not. Uh, I think that we do have uh, good initiatives, certainly with the uh, Choosing Wisely campaign, and we are engaging, you know, family physicians, and as part of that, not only educating physicians, but we are in, in, uh, educating our uh, patients as well with respect to uh, health issues and uh, encouraging them to be uh, more responsible for their health care. But you're right on a second point, the way our system of government is set up with a turnover every four years, it makes it very difficult difficult to make for that long-term plan. Um, I guess the ultimate goal is we cannot continue to do things the way that we are doing things. And is this going to be a quick turnaround? No, it's not. But we need to have that discussion and we need to start to plan, you know, for, for the future. Okay. Question just in the middle of the room. Hi, I'm Stephen Bornstein from the Center for Applied Health Research. Um, I understand why your proposal focuses on institutions. Actually, there's a good reason and a bad reason. The good reason is that we do spend a lot on institutions. The bad reason is it distracts from other areas of expenditure where we spend too much money, including possibly on physicians. Okay. So what I wonder is whether what you are proposing is going to be strictly focused on a study of the one issue where we can't possibly save all the money that we are above the Canadian average. We can save some, but there are good reasons why hospitals have to cost more here than right. elsewhere. Right. And are you, are you interested in the kind of broader discussion that includes other stuff because there are complicated trade-offs involved mm -hmm. when you close hospitals for which you have to give people something to look forward to on the positive right. side. Right. You, uh, yes. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, question and comment. Uh, you uh, mentioned about physicians. So currently, uh, physicians here in Newfoundland and Labrador, the ca per capita spending is 95%. So we are actually below the, the national average, which is, which is good. But well, that, that, that will be a, a point for a, another discussion on another day. But having said that, yes, so in proposing a review of the systems, do we appreciate that this would affect uh, physicians? Yes. Will it affect patients? Yes. But ultimately, want, what we want to, to do is to provide the best care for the patients of this province with the best financial resources that we can. So will it affect some human resources? Yes, it probably will. Will it affect doctors? Yes, it will. You know, and as physicians, we are certainly uh, part of the healthcare system. We are responsible for part of the healthcare system, and we certainly want to be involved in that, in any decisions that are made. We have time for one more. We've got it over on that side, I'm afraid. Okay. Annie School of Nursing. So Pat Parfrey talked about... Um, changes in payment models for physicians, mm -hmm. um, including capitation. So given that we have a for-profit, publicly funded system for physicians on fee-for-service, mm -hmm. what is the NLMA doing to uh, move um, to uh, other payment models, given that there are financial disincentives that impact on quality of care and health care costs? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That's a very uh, relevant question for us right now. <coughs> we are currently doing our preparation for our next round of negotiations with government, and we have heard uh, long and strongly or strongly from our members they are certainly interested in uh, alternative payment uh, models. Our current uh, fee-for-service uh, system uh, is not actually probably the best way for remuneration for our physicians or for our patients for our outcomes. So we are certainly uh, looking into uh, alternative payment plans or blended payment models, and that will be part of our negotiations uh, package probably this time around. But thank you. Okay, and we've got just under five minutes, so we can squeeze one in, oh. but the question has to be short, and the answer... Short? Same. <laughs> one more question. No one has a short question. <laughs> yeah. Oh, back to Dr. Parfrey. Can you wait for the microphone? Yeah. I just like to make. I just like to make a comment, Lynn. It's just about these payment models. Mm -hmm. Um, they, 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 whatever, however you pay um, physicians or whoever provides care, have have a. Uh, if it's a capitation model, it limits demand. 
Uh, so you, the doctors will, will organize their practices to more, most efficiently work. Uh, if you give fee per item of service, then it, it stimulates demand. So, and it, the, when, you, when, when capitation has been evaluated, it was discovered that there was more use of emergency rooms, rooms used in that particular situation. So there, it's, it, the, how you come up with a blended payment system is actually a challenge. Thank you. What we need are accountability structures and uh, measurement of outcomes and the way that practices are being, like services are being provided to make sure that there is compliance with policy and legislation and clinical practice guidelines mm -hmm. so that capitation can work or other models. I'm not an expert yeah. On, yeah. on payment models, but there are ways to measure effectiveness. I think that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Dwyer. Lots of conversations to be had. <laughs>